thank you everyone for joining us today for our uh, our session. Um, I'm very excited to have our guest, Apollo Lupescu, today. First of all, my name is Michael Thompson. Um, I am uh, the uh, partner and uh, senior wealth advisor here at Copperleaf Financial. Um, we are a wealth management financial planning firm uh, based in uh, Williston, Vermont, and we work with clients all over the country. Um, planning is um, is our core. Today, I've invited um, for our monthly town hall session, Apollo Lupescu to join us. Apollo is a, a vice president of Dimensional Funds. Um, Dimensional is uh, one of our partners and manages uh, over $600 billion in, in assets, um, core uh, of, of many of our portfolios. Um, Apollo uh, is um, is in Santa Monica, has a PhD in economics and finance from uh, UC Santa Barbara, um, and a BA in economics from Michigan State University. Um, Apollo is one of my favorite speakers, and I'm really glad that Apollo is joining us today. So um, today we're going to be talking about really um, uh, the 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 challenging markets that that we live in today. And last year. Oh, first of all, I should remind people we're recording this session, so the session will be up on our website within about a week or so. So you can you can click on it um, from the Copperleaf Financial website. Um, we do encourage questions, so if you have questions along the way, please go ahead and and um, and note them in the in the chat uh, box, and we'll we'll get to your questions. And uh, we run for about an hour today. We will end um, right at uh, one o'clock um, Eastern. So those are the those are the preliminaries and. Afterwards, if you have any questions, please reach out to us um, or when we can get you in touch with Apollo. If you have questions directly for Apollo, um, we can get questions um, uh, directed to him too. So thank you. Preliminaries out of the way. Apollo, thanks for joining us. Last year was challenging in the financial markets. Lots of ups and downs. I think lots of people had some anxiety about the about declining values in their statements and their portfolios. And, and it was even a year where we saw fixed incomes, fixed income or or bonds um, lower in the market, which was we don't see that every every um, every year. So I wanted to start off by um, helping us understand these turbulent times. And now that we're a little bit more than halfway through the year, um, what are your observations? What are we seeing out there? And and um, how do we reflect on you know what's going on this year? So what do you see? Well, first of all, Michael, hello, and, and thanks to you for inviting us back, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, and uh, it, it was great fun talking to you, so I'm so glad that you know <laughs> I have this honor of, of, of uh, doing another event with you. Uh, but I think it's a great place to start, uh, the way you framed it, because we came into this year after a very challenging 2022. And just to kind of give you a perspective, how challenging was 2022? Uh, well, if you look at the uh, uh, if you look at the the, the big uh, yardsticks in the U.S. stock market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, was down uh, about nine percent last year, uh, and that's one of the metrics of the market. The other one is the S and P five hundred index, and that was down twice as much as about eighteen percent. And then in the news, we also hear about Nasdaq, which is a third metric, uh, and that was down a whopping thirty. Three percent, a third of in value of its value in one year. Uh, so we came into this uh, uh, 2023 with with a, a bit of a, a negativity. Like not a lot of people were like excited about the market because we had such a tough year, and people were concerned. Like you know, hey, how, what's going to happen this year? Because I already lost a lot of money this year, uh, last year in 2022. So what if we you know encounter some uh, events? Could that even uh, lead to another market drop in 2023? And what's interesting is we did have some pretty major events for the first six months of the year. We did have the financial crisis. Remember on March, April, we had all those banks. Uh, they were failing. They did not look good. Uh, yes. We had the Fed continuing to raise interest rates. Uh, and uh, and then we also had this uh, uh, potential government default. We got really close uh, to the, the U.S. government defaulting. So, you know, quite a few uh, uh, items that were not really <laughs> positive uh, perception-wise for market participants. And what's interesting is that if you look as of the first six months of the year, so we'll just use that as, as a yardstick, uh, in 2023, uh, year to date, as of um, as of June 30th uh, of, of, of the year, what we saw is the Dow Jones actually being up about 4%. We saw the S&P 500 being up about, up about 16%. 
Uh, and we also saw uh, the NASDAQ being up a, a, a remarkable 32%. So uh, what's really interesting is that despite the negative feelings that we might have come in this uh, into this year, despite the challenges for the first six months, the market did actually post good results. So the first thing is there's some good news to report, uh, which is that that uh, uh, that we did see a positive uh, first uh, year, uh, first six months of the year, despite all the challenges. Now, what's also interesting is that if you look at a portfolio that, for example, you would build, now everybody is a custom portfolio, uh, so I can't really you know tell you how, how your individual performance was. But what I can tell you is that these numbers are quite different. You got a 4% for the Dow, you got an S&P 16%, and you got a NASDAQ 32% or so. And your, you know, the first question might be, well, what would I get? <laughs> well, what would a typical allocation for copper leaf uh, have seen? And again, I don't know exactly, but what I find is that a typical uh, allocation that somebody might have might have a different result than any of these. It might be in the neighborhood of maybe about 14%, 12%. It really depends, uh, but it's likely to be different than any one of these metrics. Uh, and, and perhaps the place to start here, uh, 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 Michael, is not just reflect the how the market do, but perhaps what is the market? Yeah. Because, you know, you look at these numbers and, and the legitimate question, well, what I get? Was I closer to the 4% in the Dow? Was I closer to the 32% um, in, uh, in NASDAQ? And that's a huge uh, uh, difference. Yeah, what you a know, range. Think about this. The S&P returned four times as much as the Dow. Amazing. The NASDAQ returned twice as much as the S&P and eight times as much as the Dow. So why do we see these differences and what should I expect in my own allocation? I think that might be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, and, and because that education would help, I think, investors manage their expectations and understand, you know, why is it that their results are different than all these uh, uh, yardsticks in the U.S. market? So let's start with the Dow, because that is the oldest metric of the U.S. market. It was started back in the 1880s by Charles Dow. And what he did is something that 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 seems pretty common sense. He took took the prices of 12 stocks, added them together, divided by 12, and that uh, that's how he got an average. And the idea is fairly simple. Like, you know, hey, I, I got these, uh, these, these stocks there. And back in those days, there were no calculators or computers. So you had to do everything by hand. Yeah. <laughs> so 12 was a pretty, every night to do 12 editions at, at the division. It, it's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, but what's interesting is that, uh, that that number 12 has now moved up to 30 stocks. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average has 30 companies, 30 stocks in its constituency. Uh, and the way that it is computed today is very similar to the way that, that Charles Dow did it uh, uh, you know, over 150 years ago or so. Uh, so what he did is basically took the share price, added up, and then had a something to divide by, which seems intuitive and it makes sense. Uh, the trouble is that if you do it this way, uh, what you're doing is not really, um, you know, you're not really looking at this, that, that, that the uh, the value of a company because the price mm -hmm. per share is something that the company itself can decide uh, how to change. Uh, and 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 just to make an analogy that hopefully will get this point across, right now, if you look at the Dow Jones, what it cares about is the size of a slice. And in a way, say, well, that's the size of the slice. I think, in my opinion, what matters more is the size of the pizza pie. Yes. Because <laughs> the difference is this: is if I if I look at these thirty companies and say, well, I take this one and I can cut it into two slices, that's perfectly fine. Or I can take something very similar and I can cut it into four slices. Or I can take something that's even you know similar and cut it into eight slices or more, whatever. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you realize that that in a way, the company itself can decide how much to cut the slice because the company can do stock splits or reverse yep. splits. Uh, and because of that, what's interesting about the Dow Jones is, and when you look at his const the constituents in the Dow Jones, uh, the largest holdings in the Dow Jones uh, are um, United Healthcare, which is a large company. Uh, yeah. You know, certainly not one of the largest. Uh, Microsoft, which is pretty big, and then Goldman Sachs, which is big, but again, it's not a, a huge company because again, what the Dow looks is at, at the at the size of the slice, not the size of the pie. And what's the biggest pie that we know? Well, Apple. If you look at Apple right now, Apple it's the twelfth largest uh, uh, um, uh, uh, constituent in the Dow based on its weight. So it's kind of crazy to think the largest company is somewhere in the middle of the pack. 
uh, yeah. for the Dow. And yeah. because of that, a lot of market participants don't really, you know, look at this. And, and to really understand, if it, what if you actually reshaped the Dow based on the size of the pizza pie, the size of the company, what's called the market capitalization, how many shares outstanding by, multiplied by the price per share, that's the value of the company. Well, mm -hmm. this is what the Dow would look like. Right now, yes. Apple and Microsoft, look how big the pies would be in yeah. the Dow. Yeah. And this is where United Healthcare and relative measures comes in, and this is Goldman. So the largest holding in the Dow, which is almost 10%, 9%, 10% of the Dow, United Healthcare, it's certainly a lot smaller than Apple and Microsoft. And because of that, you know, most professionals do not use the Dow. It is because it's very, very shallow. There are only 30 companies. And again, it's built um, in, in, a, in a pretty inefficient way because it doesn't really take account of the size of the company itself. And because mm -hmm. of that, a lot more market participants are using a different metric called the S&P 500. And what's yeah. interesting about the S&P 500, Michael, is that you can think of the Dow stocks as being a Russian nested doll, that all yeah. these 30 stocks are nested in the S&P 500. But because the S&P 500, it includes not only the 30 Dow stocks, but 470 other companies in the U.S., at this point, it's it's much more uh, diversified. It's much broader uh, representation of the U.S. market. And the S&P does uh, actually look at the size of the pizza pie. And the largest holdings are Apple and Microsoft. And then right after them would be Amazon, Google, and NVIDIA uh, as being the top five stocks. And you can see at this point, you know, United, United Healthcare is still somewhere there, but certainly not as big as all the other ones. So yeah. the representation in the S&P, in my opinion, is a better way because it is looking at the market capitalization and the percentage attached to each company really reflects the, the economic value of that company. And you are going to have all the Dow stocks, but they amount to only about 30% of the S&P 500. Uh, so that's, you know, so thinking of... So hold yeah. on a second. Um, Apollo, what, what I hear you say is that the Dow Jones, which is, um, you know, sort of the, the old school. We, when I was growing up, you know, my, my father used to refer to the Dow Jones industrial average and used to check the price in the, in the paper every day. And that used to be the standard measure. But there's some challenges with the Dow. It really only represents 30 companies and the way it's designed it's not really giving a good representation of the of the underlying companies. The S and P five hundred has a is a broader representation of the market. It's got five hundred companies in it, um, and and it includes the components of the Dow Jones. But as I look at this image, and this is probably where you're going, but I ask the question. Wow, does that really represent the um, the the market as a whole? Because those those big blobs there, those big circles, look to me like they're kind of swamping the rest of the the other the other four hundred uh, or five hundred companies. So, what's the impact of that? And maybe that's where you're going, but that's what stands yeah. out to me. Absolutely. And we'll come back to exactly that point that if you yeah. look right now, first of all, you, you hit it like that was a great summary uh, and you're spot on. Uh, but what's also interesting is that when people say, you know, let's look at the, the Dow as the measure of the U.S. market. Keep in mind that Amazon, Google, NVIDIA, Facebook, none of these companies are part of the Dow. So yeah. it's kind of ask how do the market do <laughs> and leave out all these big companies. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting, you're absolutely right. If you look right now in the S&P 500 and you look at the largest five companies, uh, because these large companies are so big, the five of them uh, together amount to roughly about 23% of the value of all stocks in the S&P. Wow. Because they're such large uh, uh, companies, so twenty three percent of, roughly speaking, of the da of the I'm sorry of the uh, um, of the S and P comes from these large uh, uh, companies that I mentioned: Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Google, and Nvidia. But what's interesting here, Michael, is that if you think of the Dow Jones uh, uh, being nested in the S and P, you can you can go further and say, well, what about the U S market? Are these the only companies in the U S stock market? What's in right. the S and P? And the reality is, no, these 500 companies in the S&P 500 can further be nested in a U.S. Uh, stock market as a whole. And wow. in the U.S. stock market as a whole, now you have roughly about 3,500 different companies in which you can buy ownership. 
Uh, and the S&P that represents a significant chunk, 86% of all the companies in the uh, in the US are in the S&P, uh, in the capitalization uh, metric. And what's interesting is if you do this, what you've done by diversifying, you are reducing the weight, the percentage that is now attached to these five uh, largest uh, stocks. So to me, when you've done this, you really are still now nesting the S&P stocks. Uh, they're part of the market. They're a big part of the market. But at this point, the largest five stocks, they're no longer 23%, but they're roughly about 19%. So it's still part of the market, but now you further uh, um, uh, diversify, and that reduces the concentration, the weight onto these five stocks. Mm. And the last nested doll, <laughs> Michael, is that you can think of the U.S. market as being part of a global opportunity set. So yeah. from a global yeah. perspective, the U.S. stocks are nested in a global uh, 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 marketplace. And right now you have the 3,500 in the US plus uh, over 11,000, 12,000 companies uh, uh, globally. So you now have 15,000 different companies around the world. Uh, and the US, all the US, the 3,500 US companies, they're roughly about 59% or so of the, of the global universe. Uh, and that to me is a true stock market. If you want to know how do the stocks do, well, instead of looking at the Dow, which is still part of the global marketplace, but it only amounts to 15%. In, instead of looking at the S&P, which is only really half, the results that you would have in a globally diversified portfolio would be different. Yeah. Because again, you only have about 60% or so uh, coming from the US and 40% is from abroad. And to me, that's important to know. And, and I think you touched on this very important element, which which I, I absolutely, it's worth digging in for a second. But, but uh, before, before you go there, I want to say one more thing. Sorry to interrupt, but I think this is really important. I love that image because that's actually the approach that we take with our clients to investing too, is that global approach to diversification. So so your your initial point that what did, what was my return? What was our individual client's return? It's really going to reflect the, the that global return, really the return of 15,000 stocks rather than just the return of the Dow Jones or even the S&P 500, which a lot of times we see clients come to us and most of their holdings are in the S&P 500 and and we can really uh, diversify that portfolio by starting to move them into that into a global um, market yeah. exposure. And um, and I know you'll you'll continue on that track, but I just wanted to say that that's exactly the approach that we take. So I'm so glad that you're that you're focused on that. So carry yeah, on. This is really so good. important. But, but, but you exactly right, because what you've done basically is you say, OK, well, let's look at now at the at these top five stocks and how much do, are they representative in each one of these metrics and if you look at the s p 500 i mentioned to you it's roughly about uh well let's you know it's i'll, I'll start with the uh, actually the one that's most concentrated and nasdaq and nasdaq has about 38 percent or so roughly um in these top five stocks wow just five uh, companies have, wow just five companies 38 percent that means that that they drive 38 percent of the performance is driven by these five stocks in the S&P 500 is roughly about 23%. In the US market, uh, it's about uh, 19%. And in a global uh, allocation, it's roughly around 11%. So yeah. what, what's interesting is that that as you diversify and as you kind of go from this local U.S. market to a global perspective, what you're really doing is you're reducing the way, the percentage of the portfolio allocated in these stocks, which it means that you're not missing out on them. It's just that you're not really going nuts. Uh, and you're not concentrating as much. And the reason I say this is because it seems to me that um, uh, if these five stocks would fly high, the benchmarks, the yardsticks that would be concentrated in them, for example, NASDAQ, it would do really well. When they would do very poorly, NASDAQ would do very poorly. So mm -hmm. part of the reason that you saw, for example, like you know what I mentioned earlier is that, that you look at the performance of, of the U.S. market uh, and, and you look at the NASDAQ last year being really high, really low, and this year really high, how much uh, might it have to do with the performance of these uh, top five largest stocks yeah, in, five in the five companies. Market? Right. And, and here's what's so interesting, because you talk about the narrative for this year. Well, if you look on average, these five stocks, 
uh, in 2023, on average, on average, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and NVIDIA, on average, they're up 68%. Wow. So a, a metric of the market that's heavily concentrated in them, well, it's certainly going to look better than a metric that, that is more diversified, that, that has these stocks, but in a lower percentage. And people might say, well, that, you know, why shouldn't I have more stocks uh, in, in these top five? Yeah. Well, I want to caution you because at the end of last year, what we heard is exactly the opposite. Why do I have so much money in tech? Why? Because the same exact five stocks over the course of 2022 would have lost about 38, almost 39% in value. So right. almost 40% loss in value in 2022. And they came back this year at 68%. So that's one of the reasons that you see NASDAQ having more extreme outcomes is because they're very concentrated in these five stocks. When they do poorly, like they did last year, boy, you lose a lot of money. When they do well, well, it's gonna look well. But there was one quick thing that I that I just wanna make sure my wife kind of pointed it out to me. <laughs> it's like, you know, maybe I'll take the 38% down if I'm gonna go 68% up. Uh, and there's a quick arithmetic of, of, of investing. Uh, let's say that we started 2022. Um, I'm just going to start with some, uh, you know, uh, easy to see numbers. If I started 2022 with $100 and I put in into an investment that lost 50% in its value, by the end of 2022, how much would I have? Well, I would only have 50 bucks because I lost half of it. Right. Uh, now, if I start 2023 with the same 50 bucks and I want to go back to where I was at 100 bucks, how much do my 50 bucks have to go up by? Well, 50% is not going to cut anymore because it's only right, 25. Right, so what right. I need to do is double 50 to 100. So I have to go up 100%. Right. In other words, if you, you know, in this case, if you look at last year and you say, well, we lost, let's say 40% of the value. What's interesting is that, that, that in order to come back to where it used to be, you need to go up roughly about 67%. Right, so right. the 68% that you see right now, it's not really making these, you know, like fly high and you've made so much money. All you do is is really get dig yourself out of the hole because when you have such a big drop, it takes a lot more to come back to where you used to be. Yeah, uh, and yeah. then to me, that's another argument why you ought to be really diversified and not concentrate so much and, and realize I'm not really missing uh, uh, I'm not really missing the, 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 uh, the performance of these companies. I'm just not concentrated enough in them where I can either make a lot of money or lose a lot of money. But really, uh, uh, with this global portfolio, you, you participate in the success. Uh, you also mitigate the times perhaps when they might not do, be do very well like, like last year. Yeah. Aren't we also having the benefit if we're when we're exposed to a global portfolio, it also gives us the, the benefit of being exposed to those companies that are going to be in the next five, because those five that are outperforming today, chances are they're probably not going to be the ones that continue to outperform. Am I, am I crazy there or, or is there? No, no, no you, you got it right. And in fact, I mean, we did a study that looked at exactly this, the take the top, the largest stocks in the market, and they tend to do a lot better before they get to be so large and dominant than they do afterwards. Uh, and we're certainly happy. I'll share you, uh, I'll share with you that, that, that research and you can certainly share with your clients. Uh, but there are some very intuitive reasons like folks, come on. I mean, you know, you, you, you cannot get the next Amazon if you just simply hold Amazon. I mean, that's, right. that's not the, the next Amazon is not Amazon. Right. Uh, and, and, and secondly, if you think about these companies, uh, when you get so large, it, it, it just, they become more mature. They have a track record. So things that might seem a little more steady with them, uh, but at the same time, it's not as easy to grow. I mean, if you look at uh, 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 Google or Amazon or, or Facebook, well, how are they going to sustain the same growth? Because there are only that many people on the planet. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, right. how easy it is for Google and, and, and to grow and double its in, in, in its sales or for Amazon to, to grow the, the, the client base. So it's going to be, uh, again, it's going to be interesting because um, they, they're going to have some growth, no doubt about it. But it's kind of hard to imagine that the next Amazon is actually Amazon. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's let's talk a little bit about the flip side of the the investing coin, which is bonds. You know, bonds last year, um, wow, we don't see that. Uh, you know, we kind of expect the the stock market or the equity part of the portfolio to fluctuate. You know, the the ups and downs that you described are 
you know, it might not be what we experience every year, but we certainly experience, we, we, we grow to know that we're going to have up years and down years and, and there's going to be an average of somewhere in between. But bonds, we've always been told, are are the stable part of the portfolio. And, and you know, we expect them to kind of be the ballast and kind of help us maintain value. But last year, holy cow, what happened? Uh, you know, what caused that? Was that the Federal Reserve or what What led to that? And, and where are we now? What do you think about that? Yeah, no. So let's talk about bonds, because bonds, in my view, are amazingly interesting, but they're not always they're misunderstood. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what are bonds? Because stocks we know are about buying ownership in companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Bonds are actually not about ownership in anything. Uh, but basically, bonds are a form of lending. Yeah. Corporations, yeah. governments, including the U.S. government, they need to borrow money. One way is to go to the bank and say, I need to borrow and take out a loan. Uh, that's one way to do it. The alternative way to do it is to come to investors like us and, and let's say the U.S. government or a corporation comes in and says, I'd like to borrow some money from you. Uh, and, and if you're willing to lend me the money, uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll write up a contract. So that's a really important part. There's a contract. And in that contract, we will agree at an interest rate that you, um, that you will receive. And for how long you'll receive that that interest rate, uh, which is called the maturity, uh, that's you know how long before the contract expires. And at the end of the contract, you're going to get your money back, your principal back. So mm -hmm. if I have a thousand dollars to invest, you know basically I, uh, I I I I would say I'm okay if you give me two three percent, whatever the number might be, but it's specified in the contract. I get that for the length of the contract. At the back end, I get my money back. And what's interesting about bonds is that that if you have this contract, you could actually take a company into bankruptcy uh, mm -hmm. if they don't pay you the interest. With yeah. the U.S. government, it has never missed an interest payment or a principal repayment. So a lot of folks think that that's actually a pretty good bet uh, mm -hmm. that I'm going to get my money back from the government. So you know, in that respect, uh, the, the bonds are 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 um, you know are not as as uncertain as stocks because with stocks mm -hmm. you don't know what the profits are going to be and the value fluctuates with bonds if you are told you're going to get that interest rate you're going to get that interest rate unless something happens to the issuer but if you look at a high quality like the u.s government nobody really at this point thinks i'm not going to get paid yeah uh, so what happened last year well what happened last year is that uh let's say at the beginning of the year you were uh you had a hundred thousand dollars to invest just to make a, a little interesting point here so let's say you had a hundred thousand dollars to invest and this is 2022 early 2022 and you had a let's say a 20-year horizon you just retired and you had like okay i want to plan for the next 20 years uh, from 2022 to 2042, uh, and and you had this planning horizon. And let's say at the time when you look at to buy a, a U.S. government bond, let's say for five years, and you said I'm going to buy it four times through to get to to my 20 years, uh, what you would have received is roughly about one percent in interest, mm -hmm. and you know early in the year. Uh, so if you do the math a little bit, what you find, I mean, I do the math. It's it's pretty straightforward. If you kind of do this, and interest rates stayed at one percent, nothing changed. By the end of the 20 years, you would have gotten back your $100,000, which you invested originally. Because again, everybody expects that's going to be the case. And on top of that, you would get about 1% per year uh, of $100,000. That's about $1,000 um, uh, 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 plus um, uh, the uh, interest on interest. So you would make another $22,000 in interest over the life of this um, uh, this this 20-year uh, period. And yep. then so you would have about $122,000 at the end. Which is yep. kind of that's 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 what happens if you get this one percent bond, mm -hmm. uh, and so far so good, you know. Now mm -hmm. what happened is, and for a variety of reasons, uh, because of inflation, because you know investors expect to at least be compensated in that interest rate, at least part of the inflation there. And I want to make sure that at least I stay ahead of my uh, my the inflation uh, for a variety of reasons. By the end of 2022, so later in the year. The same exact bonds, newly issued by the government, so that not the ones from the beginning of the year, but the new ones that were issued towards the end of the year, were no longer paying 1%, but they're rather paying 4%. Wow. So a lot more in interest. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. If you, Michael, if you had the 1% bond that you bought at the beginning of the year, you're not forced to sell. You can just hang on to your bond. You can just 
you know, get you one percent that we promised, and you'll be you you won't lose any money because you know that you're gonna get paid. But so I might the, be kicking myself thinking, holy cow, I could get four percent exactly. today. Exactly. So now you have a choice. You can say, I can stay with this, have no loss whatsoever, and I can just keep chugging along. But now you are presented with another option. What if I sell because I like the four percent more? Well, the trouble is that if you have a bond that pays 1%, where anybody can go buy a new one for 4%, your bonds are not worth as much. They're just right. simply are not worth as much because your, uh, your, your bonds don't pay as much as the new ones. So if you try to sell them, and because bond prices are driven by math, if you try to sell them, uh, what uh, uh, the market's going to do is say, I will buy them from you, but I'm not going to pay you 100000 the full value because they're not worth as much, but perhaps I'll pay you about $86,000. So at this point, you are going to have a loss. So should you choose to sell? That's when you would you would see a loss. If you hang on to your 1% bonds, again, there is no loss. But now, as you said, you can you have a decision to make. Now, what happens is that what do you, you can do the math and say, what if I actually sell, take the initial loss, and now I earn uh, uh, 4%. So you're not starting with 100,000, you're starting with 86,000. And that's why some people saw losses into their uh, into their uh, uh, bonds is because if they were to sell them and and you know bond funds uh, a lot of times they have to you know look at the value of the the bonds even if you don't sell them called mark to market but the idea is that if you now are selling these bonds you take a loss and this is what people experience a painful loss in bonds. Now you can take the eighty six thousand, uh, which you would uh, would you you would have gotten for your bonds, and now you can reinvest it at four percent. So now you're not making one percent, but you're making four yeah. percent. So how does the math look at that point? Well, mm -hmm. I would say for the first four or five years, uh, you are you would have been better off uh, just sticking with a one percent bonds. Yeah. Once you cross this threshold, the, the break-even point, and if you look over the entire duration of, of, of this planning horizon, what you would see is mathematically by the end of these uh, uh, 20 years, if you were to get, uh, if you're going to earn now 4%, you would end up with roughly about $189,000. So quite substantially more than you would have had, um, than you would have had uh, if you stuck with the 1% bonds. So what's interesting, Michael, the reason I bring this up is that people last year saw the bad news of seeing losses in their bonds portfolios, which is not really uh, something that people expected. On the other hand, what's also interesting is that if you look at the planning horizon that people typically have, a lot of times this actually might have been a really good thing. Because that initial loss, uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that now if you take this money and reinvest it, you're going to reinvest at 4%, uh, which over the long run might actually give you a um, uh, might give you actually a, a, a better outcome than if you think a state at 1%. So it's, it's, it's one of those interesting things that it's a good news, bad news. And mm -hmm. these are for five-year bonds. Yeah. Uh, but I got to tell you, Michael, there's one really interesting thing that I want to mention. I'm not going to do much math. This is not yeah. going to be a math class. Yeah. Uh, but it is interesting that that if you look at um, uh, the, the change, so this triangle means change in value mm -hmm. of bonds. We know that it, that it, it, it has to do with the change in interest rate. And the, the, the more the interest rate changes by going up, well, the lower the value of your bonds because the new ones pay more. So the old ones with a much lower rate, it's not going to pay as much. But mm -hmm. what's the relationship here? And you can say roughly this has to do with the metric called duration, which is, you know, how long before you get your money back, which is roughly ties a little bit into maturity. Um, and, and the reason I think it's important is because if you have, for example, a, a 2%, just to make a case, you have a 2% increase in interest rate uh, and you have a one-year bond. Uh, well, how much do you stand to lose? One times uh, 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 one times two percent. You stand to lose about two percent in uh, the value of your um, uh, of your of your uh, uh, bonds. So two yep. percent is not pleasant, but it's not devastating. Again, these are one year. They typically consider to be shorter term. Mm -hmm. If you now have the exact same two percent increase but you have some longer term bonds, let's say they're 10 years in duration, the same exact 2% increase is going to lead to a drop of 20% right. in the value of your bonds, which is uh, very different in, if you ask me. 
Yeah. Uh, so what mattered a lot last year when you look at bonds is what was the maturity? How long were these bonds? Were they short-term bonds and the long-term bonds? And what I can tell you is that the short-term bonds took a much smaller hit on a relative basis uh, than long-term bonds. So the, the more you were into the long-term bonds, the one that the contract might be for 10 years, 20 years, those took, those took a lot of a bigger beating uh, than, uh, um, uh, than the ones at the shorter end. Yeah. And, and so where are we today? And I, and I think this probably leads to a conversation about inflation as well and the Federal Reserve, because all this really is a result of the Federal Reserve making adjustments, trying to fight inflation, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I believe. Um, so where are we from a context standpoint today? Do we have a better sense of of what's going on? Because one of the things that I noticed and I wonder about last year is, you know, at the end of 2021, leading into to the beginning of last year, I don't think anybody anticipated that the Federal Reserve was going to raise rates as aggressively as they did. Um, and I think, you know, what from what I hear, that was that that was that was a big part of the pain that we experienced there. So so for context, where are we today, do we think? Yeah. So a lot of you mentioned the Fed and raising rates uh, to fight inflation and, and to put some context, a lot of it really has to do with uh, the lessons that we learn as economists. Uh, and particularly the Fed, uh, lessons that, that that go back to, to the last time that we had high inflation in the U.S., which is in the uh, early 70s. And in the early oh, yeah. 70s, we had uh, three things that really um, were major events kind of happening at the same time. And the first one was that uh, up until 1971, in order for the U.S. government to print a dollar bill, it needed to have gold in the bank. There was something called the gold standard. Right, uh, right. But in April, and actually it was August of 1971, President Nixon went on TV and he said, you know, not anymore. As of today, the dollar is no longer tied to gold. And because of that, there was, you know, I would imagine, Michael, think today that the, 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 the president goes on TV and tells you that the U.S. government can now print as many dollar bills as it's want, as it wants. There is Amazing. no backstop. There's no backstop. There's there's nothing to prevent it from running run to, running the printing machines day and night. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's understandable that back in those days, there was a bit of apprehension and, and folks were feeling a little bit like, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, right. So there was that, 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 that uh, element, which we can't discount the behavioral element of, of life. Uh, the second thing that happened, we had a, uh, the uh, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, who decided not to send oil to the U.S. And we had a pretty major oil crisis. Uh, an energy shock in the country. And there was, you know, roughly around 1973 or so. Uh, and at about the same time, we also had a, uh, um, a global drought that led to food shortages and, and high prices in food around the world. So we had these three things, the confluence of these three things happening at the same time, and prices started to go up in the early 70s. And the Fed realized that, boy, you know what, we have two mandates. One is to keep prices stable, and two, to have good economic activity and low unemployment. Not in a particular order, just like these are the two main mandates. Yeah. And what they realized is that when the prices went up, they had to do something about it. And they realized that if we increase the interest rates, well, that's going to make it more expensive for businesses to add warehouse space and borrow. That's going to make it more expensive for consumers because their mortgages might, might go up as interest rates go up. And, and, and together, that's going to uh, uh, basically reduce the pressure on prices because the demand from consumers and businesses is going to go down. And when demand goes down, the prices, the pressure on prices would uh, would would actually uh, um, just uh, uh, go down a bit. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. When they did this, they increased interest rates, inflation started to go down, but then something happened. As you have consumers and businesses pulling back, the economic activity also slowed. Ouch. Uh, and at that point, it was like, well, like, whoa, just kidding, just kidding. You know, we're going <laughs> to reverse course and we're going to, you know, cut the rates so we don't want to hurt the economic activity. And they've done this uh, a few times. They flip flopped a few times. And here's the problem. When they did this, uh, you know, uh, businesses and, 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 and citizens of the country, uh, they're not exactly sure that the Fed is serious about fighting inflation. And they said, well, right. you, know, they're, you know, I expect inflation to, st to stay high because, you know, the Fed is not serious about fighting it. And the problem is that when you have an expectation of inflation, that expectation by itself 
will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. Why? If you're a union and you expect way, you know, uh, prices to go up for you know inflation to be at ten percent for the next five years, and you're a decent negotiator, what are you going to fight for? Well, at least a ten percent increase in wages. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. that what it means that the company has to raise prices, and then it becomes that 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 the uh, wage price spiral that you hear about. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in the seventies. That that expectation of high inflation led to high inflation, and it's really disruptive for businesses for consumers. Uh, and that was the case for the 70s until the late 70s when a new Fed chairman came along. His name was Paul Volcker. And this gentleman came along and said, you know what? No, 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 no. We're not doing this anymore. We are going to send a message that the Fed is serious about fighting inflation. And we're going to stick with the high rates for as long as it takes to tame inflation and send the clear message and reassure people that we are serious about fighting inflation. And that's exactly what he did. And all mm. of a sudden, like there was a realization, well, actually, the Fed is actually serious about this time, about fighting inflation. And then uh, we had uh, the prices going down. Now, the thing is that in the as the Fed was doing this, there was an economic downturn in the early 80s because uh, there was raising rates uh, and because they stuck with high rates. Uh, and then we had like the early 80s for a couple of years, we had a recession and that was you know certainly not pleasant. What we had afterwards, though, Michael, were 40 years of price stability right and right that's what we got used to the idea that if there was to have we, we were have inflation the fed will actually do whatever it takes and that's what the fed learned so now if you rewind to last year the inflation goes from four five six seven eight nine at that point the fed is like you know we're not gonna uh, make the mistakes that we made in the early 70s and flip-flop we're gonna send the message and we're gonna stick with high rates until inflation is in check and the fed was very clear about this so I think most people who are paying attention, they're, they're like the economists and so forth and knew the story. They realized that the Fed is smart enough to stick with the high rates. So what would you do <laughs> if you're in right. your shoes looking right. at the history of the 70s? Yeah. And that's exactly yeah. what I've been doing. Uh, and, you know, what's interesting is that today, even as they've been raising rates, uh, what we did see is the really good news is that inflation went from nine to eight to seven to six to five to four. It's even below four today. So it's really coming back to historical averages uh, and it's expected to go down the same way. Uh, if you look at the uh, some metrics of, of the market called the break even inflation rate. But it's also interesting, Michael, is that 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 uh, at the same time, even with this increase in interest rates, consumers are still spending. Yeah. Businesses are still spending, so we're yeah. not seeing that economic downturn that happened in the early 80s. So again, that's really good news. You still hear some talk sometimes about maybe there is a recession coming. It's possible. Uh, I just think that with every day going along, we see that inflation is coming down. At the same time, unemployment is incredibly low. Economic activity is still booming. So there's no you know, ominous sign to say there is an upcoming recession. And that's the good news. Uh, so in that respect, perhaps we're going to see a different result than than we saw uh, in the in the late 70s and early 80s. So perhaps we might or might not be able to avoid this economic downturn. At least at this point, the probability, the chance of recession has been diminishing uh, with every month because market participants are saying things are still looking very robust. And the Fed might or might not increase rates, but we're getting to the point where inflation is coming back to the desired level. So at this point... You know, there's not much need for the long run for the Fed to keep increasing rates. You know, um, I'm so glad that you you took us through that uh, that history lesson, Apollo, because um, you know it's so important to remember not only what the how the Federal Reserve um, adjusted its behavior and um, and how economists and and business owners. It grew to take the Fed seriously and understand, you know, that it had a, a serious intent to fight inflation and um, and was going to stick to its guns. Um, you know, that context is so important today when we see people, you know, um, as you said, sometimes, you know, kind of raising the alarm that, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, we're going to be headed into inflation. And, you know, the Fed's going to change course and start lowering rates suddenly and, and uh, up and down. But it sounds like if, if history is our guide, at least over the last few decades, it's not likely that the Fed is going to be flip-flopping and, and kind of chain, chasing its tail. We're, we're, sounds like we've got some stability um, in, in the office there. 
Absolutely. And I think that that's it's reflected into what the expectations of the market are. Uh, and there's this metric that is um, you know, really well known to bond traders because the way that bonds are priced, some are uh, covered, covering uh, investors for inflation, others don't. And the difference in the way they're priced is called um, break-even inflation rate. Uh, and the Fed actually keeps track of this. And I'll share with you the live website of the Federal Reserve oh, looking yeah. at the five-year break-even inflation rate. And because it's not a household term, I might as well read what it says, is that this value implies what market participants with different opinions about what might be next expect inflation to be in the next five years on average. Mm -hmm. so this is not one individual opinion. This is not a forecast. It's basically coming from the way that investors vote with billions of dollars when they buy bonds. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the number as of uh, as of last night, uh, the the fourteenth uh, of uh, um, uh, August, uh, that break even inflation rate is about two point two nine percent. So the yeah. expectation is that on average, inflation would be about two point three percent. Uh, and just to give context, long-term average in the U.S. is about um, uh, is about three percent, uh, and the Fed's own target is about two percent. So what we're seeing right now is is really that the markets are pricing in an expectation of pretty much spot on on average over the next five years uh, about a, um, a, the, the the desired Fed interest so uh, Fed in, uh, inflation rate. And, and that's again, it's it's good because what we're looking at is what's the expectation, and this is again. Some people are pessimistic about it. Some people are optimistic. This value tends to combine both of these uh, opinions. Yeah, that's that's so important. And I'm, I'm so glad to have you share that because, you know, our approach is 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 data driven and, and we refer to our our approach as, as evidence based or evidence driven. And, and therefore, you know, based on those factors for our long-term financial planning, we're using a 2.7% inflation factor, which is which is right in there. And yep. and some people say, whoa, whoa, inflation's a, shouldn't we be using a 5% inflation factor? And and we can kind of go back to the data and go back to the evidence and say, well, maybe, but but here's what we see based on based on the evidence. Um, that's important. Let's, you know, let's talk about um the future a little bit. <laughs> you know, we've we've got a little bit of time left and and, you know, all kinds of things are, are in the news. Certainly the economy is in the news and the and the markets. And it's easy for us to forget um, that we went through this banking crisis and the and the the near government shutdown and all those things. It's a, it's remarkable to think back over the last six months and that we experienced those things. Today, so much in the news that I hear about in the headlines is is this thing called artificial intelligence, um, and it makes me wonder and clients wonder what what's that? What should we be thinking about there? What what's going on there? Right. Um, um, do you have any thoughts about artificial yeah, intelligence? Absolutely, because it is it is very big, uh, uh, pretty much across the country. And it, what's interesting, Michael, is that. Um, this is years ago, but uh, years and years ago, uh, somebody uh, uh, gave me uh, a little gift and I was like, it kind of wrapped it up and I was like, what is, what is it? It was a magazine uh, and, and I kept it and, and, and recently I kind of thought about it and it kind of came back to life. And that magazine was published in 2015. And the reason I, I remember the magazine, because uh, it was a, a guy with a bowl head, just pretty much like me. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing behind my head, but, but <laughs> it's you. It's me. <laughs> Might as well be me. Uh, it was this uh, this guy with a USB and the headline was artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and it got me thinking, like, you know, is this something that just popped out yesterday, uh, as it seems like uh, since November, that artificial intelligence? And the reality is it's not really, because uh, if you look year after year, there was um, – there were reports of artificial intelligence and the march of machines and and uh, and this cover that was generated years ago uh, uh, with uh, uh, with just a, a computer. Uh, this, so, so this cover is not designed by a human by a computer. Uh, and then you also had you know is it evil or is it uh, is it something that that could help us all? So the, this idea that that AI is something that just emerged yesterday. I got to put some context. It's been around for a long time. What I, what I found is that 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 uh, AI has been usually uh, uh, mostly used behind the scenes. 
Hmm. For example, not just to pick on any one company, but just to illustrate, for example, Google Translate uh, for a long time has been using some, you know, some form of artificial intelligence, but it was behind the scenes. Uh, if you look at it right now that, that that you start typing something and there was an autocomplete, like all of a sudden magically it shows up. We've had that for years. Uh, and so there uh, there have been uh, uses of, 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 uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, for years and years, uh, what happened in November, though, we had this uh, system that came out uh, to the public uh, called Chat GPT, uh, and and what this what this did is just really blew everybody's mind because he was able to interact uh, with uh, uh, with us in a much more human like way. The answers seemed like really polished and really like wow, that's that seems like it's almost thinking, uh, and it's important to understand what is artificial intelligent and what is it not uh yeah, and it's yeah. in that respect we also want to under, understand how it will impact the world and by mm -hmm. that i mean the economy socially and then differentiate that from what it means to you as an investor so let's yeah, touch yeah. on 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 these three things what exactly is this form of ai that we see right now uh what does it mean to the world uh and then third what does it mean to us as an investor so let's start with the first one what is artificial intelligence in the current format well, artificial intelligence basically uh, um, works a little bit different than a typical way in which a computer is programmed. If you want to program a computer, you have to specify for every single instance. If you push this button, then the computer does a certain action. And you have to program the computer uh, to respond in a certain way for every interaction with the user. And you have to think of everything. What if you click there? What's going to happen? So you have to program the computer every step. And, and for everything that the computer does, there's a reason why it's doing it because it was pre-programmed by the programmer. Now, the, the AI came up with a different way of thinking about it. And AI basically said, wait, wait, wait. Instead of programming the computer uh, uh, to, to for every single thing to execute based on what he was already told to do, when we train the computer, we write a program and, and we ask the program to train itself in identifying patterns. So you want to find a look at patterns. So you have to feed the computer a lot of data. And as you feed the computer all this data, the computer, this program is trying to identify patterns in the data. And once it identified, identifies patterns in the data, the objective is uh, to come up with uh, a, an output. And the output, for example, could be what is the most likely word after uh, 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 the previous one? So, you know, if it's uh, if it's a matter of, um, you know, uh, like a long, long time, you know, you know, the next word is going to be a go. So it's the idea of predicting what is likely to be the next word. And that's what the, uh, the AI does. It identifies the patterns. And then once it identifies the pattern, then it's trying to predict the next word. Let me see. Um, let me see. I want to interrupt for a second. Let me see if, if I've got this, because um, several years ago, my daughters introduced me to this app that you could you could you could let the phone, let the app hear certain parts of a melody and it would identify the song because I was trying to figure out what was the song. And my daughter said, oh, here's this app. I don't even remember the name of it. You know, we'll play, <laughs> yes, yeah. Play a few bars of the song and the, and the app identifies the, the song. I think that's exactly what you're talking about, isn't exactly it? Exactly right. You look at the exactly you, you 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 feed enough songs in there and then it identifies the patterns of that. Uh, exactly right. And this is kind of doing the same thing on steroids. Uh, so it's really looking at, 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 at a lot of data. So uh, this format, this what we have today, is called a large language format. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a type of AI that exists right now. And basically what you're doing is you're feeding all this information. It's basically everything that exists on the internet uh, in, a, in a way that you can think that way, like tons of information from the internet that the computer gets trained on. And there's some human training that goes with it. But ultimately, when you do this, that's when the computer is able to identify the pattern and create a sentence. And to me, it is interesting. It's fascinating. The thing is that, number one, it is trained on what is on the Internet. And uh, I can't tell you that everything on the Internet is basically no. super reliable. <laughs> right. got to be careful there. But number yeah. two is that the really important thing to understand is that this type of AI, it is pretty much like a tariff. 
Yeah. You can train the parrot to say a sentence and it, it's impressive. Wow, did you hear that parrot saying that? Ha ha, it's so funny. It's interesting. But the parrot doesn't understand context. The parrot doesn't understand why. It's just repeating something that seems impressive, but it doesn't have any thought behind it. So the current one is just simply looking through these vast data uh, uh, sets. It identifies a pattern and then creates an output, which, you know, it is a very good parrot uh, to be to begin with. Now, there's a different form of um, of AI that's called artificial uh, general intelligence, AGI, uh, that is much more sophisticated and, and it's supposed to really understand context and why it's just that's not here now. It's it, it might come down the road, but it's certainly not here today. So let's start with that, that today's artificial intelligence, it doesn't seem to be the type of computer that would take over the world. It's just simply, it's a parrot uh, that's repeating things that finds on the internet and it puts them into a uh, uh, into this model. Now, yep. what does it mean to, as a society? Frankly, I say, I say Michael, that, that as a society, uh, there are going to be some interesting things. Like there are going to be some jobs who are going to maybe become obsolete. There are other ones who are going to become more sophisticated. Uh, but by and large, I think it's it's a it's something that that it's to be determined exactly how how this will impact. I can tell you though that that if you look at um, this as being a tool that you have now to be more productive, um, you know it's 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 quite possible that that the beneficiaries of AI might not necessarily be the people who came up with AI, but the mm-hmm. users. Yeah. And if you think of like the 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 you know the code that you scan at the at the supermarket, well, I'm not sure that those companies are making tons of money. Uh, but you know the the grocery stores and and the vendors who are using it, they're 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 benefiting because it's much more streamlined. So it's not clear right now who's going to be the big beneficiary. But as an investor, I'll leave I'll leave you with this: as an investor here, you got to be um, mindful that this particular approach that that we share, Michael, this idea of markets being a pretty good uh, uh, a very good way to incorporate information, uh, which is called the efficient markets. In a way, it is the ultimate AI, yeah. Because AI is taking all this information, is processing it and identifying something, and it creates an output. In this yeah. case, being a word. In the case of the market, it takes all the information from these thousands and thousands of market participants, every piece of information, it crunches it in this machine, the market, and then what it comes out with is a price. So in a way, I would argue that the stock market and market efficiency is the ultimate AI. So we've used the form of AI uh, for 40 years, um, but what also means for an investor is that you do not need to get carried away uh, with overemphasizing AI in your portfolio. And, and I say this for a number of reasons. One is that if you look at the economic activity and where it comes from, what's the value of AI in the, uh, in the economy right now? And frankly, you know, when I have my coffee in the morning, it has nothing to do with AI. When I eat my yogurt, uh, when I go and I, and I you, know, I, you know, my kids get haircuts, not I, all of these other activities that we're doing every day, very little have to do with AI. So you want to have AI, but commensurate with uh, the value in the economy. Of AI, and right now it's not really as great as as it's being made sound. Well, suddenly, you want to be, go ahead. and really, what you're saying is that AI is already built into what we're doing, exactly because the right. market is really a giant AI machine, and it's exactly. taking into account all of that data and adjusting. And so we're actually getting the benefit of artificial intelligence simply by participating in a globally diversified portfolio the way we are and not trying to outsmart it, but really taking advantage of that giant, very smart computer that is the market, right? Absolutely. And and to add to your uh, comment, Michael, what I would argue is that by the introduction of these more sophisticated systems in the world today, uh, the markets are becoming even better at, at, at kind of getting to that price to, to kind of create the output that I'm talking about. In other yeah. words, uh, the current format of AI is not weakening the market and making it more likely for you to be able to, uh, to, to outsmart the market and to find something that nobody else has found and that everybody has missed. Exactly the opposite. I would say it's incrementally yeah. harder now. Yes. You thought it was hard before. It's going to be yeah. like in, impossible for me to imagine. How is it that now, with every with these tools available to so many more investors and tools getting yeah. more sophisticated, how can you possibly say that this is going to somehow create an advantage for one person? Yeah, uh, yeah. it's. I, I would say that this, if anything, makes it uh, incrementally harder 
uh, for anybody who attempts to uh, to really outperform by picking stocks or timing the market. I think that that it, the, the the advent of AI is one more uh, reason why people should not engage in stock picking or market timing because it is now so much harder. Absolutely agree. Well, Apollo, as usual, time has flown by. It's been no. a real pleasure having you as our guest today. Thank you so much. I know you provided tremendous education uh, for our guests, and um, you know we'll have this up on our on our website to share more broadly in another week or so. Um, thank you so much. I want to encourage people to join me next month for our town hall, where we're, our topic is going to be cybersecurity. So lots of things to think about there, lots of uh, lots of scams and lots of things that that are that are certainly going on in terms of innovation there that we need to protect ourselves from. So thank you, Apollo, once again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and um, have a fantastic rest of your month.